Okay, guys, where am I going to pop out at? You've been watching my videos for a while now. Am I going to pop out under the desk, off to the right side of the screen, jumping on my bed, jump out from behind the bed? I'm in the room. I'll guarantee you that much. I'm in the room. Vote now. Ha-ha! <laughs> Lying! Mankind's greatest invention! Teching tumble! All right, so, um... <laughs> Are you ready for this, Barry? Are you ready for this? Guys, this is Barry's very first popularity poll. I don't know if he's ready for this, but it's okay, I guess, because the best way to learn something is just to dive right in and do it, right? No, that's that's horrible advice. You, you don't know how to swim, just jump in the ocean. You'll be okay. Just like, no, horrible advice. All right, so this will be the top 10 best moments in one piece. It'll look more impressive when I throw the text up, so I'm not just flailing my arms at the camera, which is what I'm doing right now. All right. So, thanks to everybody that voted. This voter turnout was the highest we've ever had for any other previous popularity poll, and that includes the boob one. The boob poll was only 14,936 votes. The swordsman uh, poll I did last year was actually less than that at 14,187. Um, just more love for the boobs there. But this poll was a walloping 21,000. 1,884, once again, will be a lot more impressive when I put the numbers in in post. Gah! So, yeah, that was that was a great turnout, especially since the other polls were open for an entire week. This one was only open for three days, which I think is going to be the standard from now on. I had a lot of fun with this. Um, I thought this was going to be a lot more of a, like, Herculean process, but it was actually, everything ran very smoothly. We did the preliminaries. We narrowed everything down, made a nice-looking poll. Everybody voted, um, and we're here with the results today. Okay, so uh, let, let's just dive into this. We got ten epic moments from the series that I'm sure you're all going to be really uh, just frothing at the mouth to hear and me talk about again many of these I already talked about before but let's let's just dive right in here we go number 10 with 591 votes we have a spoiler moment because there was a moment I put in the poll which I'll be honest with you this was more of just my decision on my part I decided you know what that moment that happened like two chapters ago in One Piece manga readers know exactly what I'm talking about I think that deserves to at least be on the list because it was you know I'm not just gonna put something on there just because it happened recently but come on now that that thing we found out in chapter 957 that was that was a pretty big moment but I'll throw a spoiler warning in case you you know haven't uh, gotten to that part yet in the manga here's a time code to skip to number Number nine. None of the other moments are spoiler heavy, so don't worry about that. But um, yeah, that that was a pretty big moment. Okay, so for that being the reason, I'm now gonna get to it. Number ten with 591 votes, the reveal of the Yonko bounties plus Roger's bounty in chapter 957. Okay, now. There's, I think the reason why so many people voted for this was not just because it happened recently and, of course, it's fresh in people's minds. No, this has been a question that we have been wanting to know about ever since bounties, the whole concept of them, have been, you know, introduced in the story. Way back at East Blue when we had, like, Arlong's bounty, and then after Arlong Park we had the reveal of Buggy and Krieg's bounty, and then, like, Luffy stands amongst, you know, higher than all of them. He's the highest, you know, the most wanted man in the entire East. Okay, and then, of course, throughout the Grand Line, bounties become really, you know, more important to us, the fans, and just like, oh, well, what are the Warlord's bounties going to be, and all that stuff, you know, oh, Crocodile's bounty was four times higher than Arlong's, oh no, you know, and it's just a big deal whenever the Straw Hats get an up in their bounties and stuff, so the big question in everybody's minds was, I mean, at the beginning was, we knew about Roger, Roger being the king of the pirates, what was his bounty? This was the question for a very, very long time, decades, and we finally find the answer to not only that question, but also the question to what Whitebeard bounty is and all the other Yonko that we we don't learn about the Yonko proper until a little bit later in the story until around after Eni's Lobby we find out about like this concept of these great emperors that rule the second half of the Grand Line but even so we knew about Shanks and we knew he was a really strong pirate so yeah I, I think it's just the culmination of that a moment that Oda has known that we've been just waiting for like a bunch of just hungry dogs just like just give it 
it to us, Oda. What's Rogers bound to? Just give it to us, please. And he finally was like, yeah, all right, fine. I'll give it to you. When will I give it to you? Whenever I want to, because I'm Oda. All right, and he just decided, you know, after Act 2 of Wano, that seems to be the best place in the story to give it to you. Not after the end of Wano or some big culmination. No, no, in the middle of another arc, I'm just going to drop these bounties. And just like, all right, fine, that's cool. Whitebeard with a bounty of question mark million. And Shanks with a bounty of 700 million. The actual bounties are a lot higher than that, of course. Um, you know, I, I don't remember the exact, exact numbers. Well, Whitebeard's is 5 billion, 46 million because of the joke with Shiro. And Shanks is like 4 billion something else. So it's, it's around that range, okay? And I'll throw the numbers up here and everything like that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, the moment itself is also augmented by the fact that it's uh, Sengoku telling this big epic story about this uh, legendary pirate rocks. Almost as if Oda is telling us that's like, yeah, it's okay for us to learn the bounties of these legendary pirates. It's okay for us to learn about the bounty of Roger because now we're finding out about this pirate that could even Roger... Um, even rival Roger in his heyday, Rocks D. Zebek. So it, it kind of feels like that. It's just like, all right, one mystery is being closed, but another one is just being opened up. The mystery of Rocks and his crew and what he was all about and how strong that pirate was and how he's going to play a role into the One Piece story later on down the line. So yeah, that that's really, and then, you know, it was just really cool to hear like Sengoku talk about that and all the other Marines in the entire room were just like, oh, these numbers are getting so big. It's making me dizzy because that's basically what we were thinking this entire time. So, yeah, that, that's that's the only spoiler on the list. All right, so moving on to number nine with 644 votes. Shanks is here. What's he here to do? He's here to kick ass and chew bubblegum and also to stop this war. Number nine, Shanks stops the war. Uh, that's the way I put it on the poll. I was just like, usually on the poll what I would do is I would put down a quote of like a famous moment and then a description of what the, the moment entailed. And with Shanks's, I was just like, I'm here to end this war, hyphen. Shanks ends the war. So yes, that's what he does. Um, this was something I don't think anybody saw coming, alright? Did you see this coming? You're a liar too. I know you're just mad about the door thing. Okay, no. Alright, big epic war at Marine Ford. Whitebeard and all of his allies and his crew go up against the Marines. The Admirals are there. Luffy's group is there, obviously. Everything is insanity. You know, how is this gonna end? Blackbeard shows up and it's like, what the f- Okay, where is this gonna go, right? And we already knew, I think Oda even threw this in to throw us off of it, like Shanks and Kaido had an altercation like the day before. So it's like, okay, well, Shanks and Kaido, that's the reason they're not going to get involved. We didn't even know about Big Mom yet. We didn't even know. We, we knew she existed, but we didn't know her name. We didn't even know the last Yonko was a female at this point, right? So Big Mom wasn't name dropped, I think, until after Marine Ford by Kid. But anyway, yeah. So Kaido and Shanks are busy doing their thing. So whatever, you know, they're not going to be able to show up. You know, this war has to end somehow, right? And so um, just when we're at our darkest hour after, you know, Blackbeard, you know, unloads on Whitebeard and everything like that, Ace is dead. And so like, is, is Blackbeard just going to take over freaking Marine Ford at this point? Like what's going to go down? Uh, a brave young Marine by the name of Kobe with a K stands up to kind of just like, you know what? I can't stand this anymore. This fighting needs to end right here. And it was actually that that was the uh, the beginning of this because then Shanks arrives, blocks Aka Inu's attack, kind of commends Kobe. He's like, well, well going, young Marine. Um, your few seconds of courage, that was that meant all of this in the tide of this battle. You know, that meant the ending of all this, okay? Um, if you were just able to hold out for just those few seconds, okay? So then Shanks arrives, and Shanks, by the way, after his fight or altercation with Kaido or even the Beast crew, I don't know, was it ever stated that, you know, Shanks and Kaido had a direct fight? Or it was just he had a run-in with, with Kaido's crew? I don't know. But Shanks shows up looking like a million bucks. He looks perfectly fine. He doesn't have any battle damage on him. His crew looks fine. His ship looks fine, all right? So you take that whatever you will, right? And so Shanks, you know, he's a baller. He just walks right up to the Admirals, and, you know, Sengoku's there and everybody, and and he says, you know, I'm here to end this war. And this is a guy that's like one armed dude, uses a sword, doesn't have any crazy devil fruit powers or anything like that. He shows up and says, this war is over. Like he's dad getting home from work and some bickering children. And he's like, hey, 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 knock it off. You know, go to your rooms. Basically, it's over. It's done. 
and then that's it, right? Um, so that just proves right there how much of a biggity badass Shanks is. Like, if we didn't already know that, we know it now. This is the point where you find out. I mean, yeah, he did the Conqueror's Hockey with the Sea King. He clashed with Whitebeard. He was vaunted as one of the strongest swordsmen with only one arm. I mean, yeah, there's all those reasons. Just the fact he shows up at a war and just like, hey, knock it off. And they do. Now, granted, at this point, they also lost a lot of people. You know, both sides did, right? The Marines lost a bunch of their soldiers. Whitebeard Ace died, as I mentioned. So, Sengoku was also kind of like, alright, yeah, we got... He's a smart enough dude to be like, alright, we gotta cut our losses. Alright, come on, guys. We gotta end this at some point. And Sengoku was like, nah, alright, alright, it's over. I'm calling it off. I'll take all responsibilities for this. And there's that epic moment where Shanks just kind of, like, draws Griffin and then stands with his crew, which, once again, the Red Hair crew do not number that large, you know, in numbers. You know, they're like a few dozen pirates. And he's just like, hey, guys, you know, you still... If anybody out there still wants to fight, if you're just like, hey, hey, Aki Inu, it's probably who he was talking to, he's like, hey, Aki Inu, you still want to fight? We're right here. We'll fight you. You know, and so everybody at that moment was like, okay... Yeah, one Yonko is all we could really deal with for the day. We're going to call it here, and they do. And, um, yeah, that, that was an epic moment. It sucked that Luffy was kind of comatose at this point, so he didn't get to meet Shanks. But, you know, Shanks said it best. He's like, he picks up the hat and gives it over to Buggy, and he's like, Buggy, give this back to Luffy and everything. And everybody's just kind of like, I think even, like, Lucky Roo goes up to Shanks and is like, don't you want to see Luffy? It's been ten years. And Shanks is just like, nah, 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 it's cool. I mean, it'd be really nice to meet him and chat with him and all of his adventures and stuff, but he still has all these adventures to come. And we made this promise that we're not going to see each other again until he becomes the King of the Pirates, right? And so that's when he's going to apparently give this hat back to me and stuff. That was the whole promise they made. So, you know, it was kind of like a missed opportunity there but not really because luffy was comatose not much of the conversation they could have had right so um but yeah that's that's number nine shanks ends the war all right this will be uh number eight with 663 votes the death of dr here look and the final um quote that he made you know when does a man die all right so this was a great moment in the anime i've gushed about this moment so many times before it helps that ave maria is playing in the background this very somber rendition of it like ave maria is kind of always somber but you know what i mean it's just like okay here's here's this wintry island it's cold it's frigid you know snow's falling and then there's this cruel king that's ruling over all of it and he's like, you know, I want all the doctors, all the other peasants, they can they can go and get sick. I don't care. I'm like, I'm, I'm Wapple. I could do whatever. I'm the king. And strewn throughout this country, there's a few people that are just dedicated to try to make life better for the citizens. Dr. Kareha was one of them. Dr. Hiraluk and Chopper were others. And so... Dr. Hirolock hears this call that all these, um, the, the, the 20 MDs, the Ishin 20, are all sick. I'm gonna go help them. I'm the only one that can do it. I'm gonna save this country. He gets there, Wapple reveals it's all just, uh, it was an act, it was, uh, it was a trap to get Hirolock up there, and they were gonna eliminate him, and Hirolock, you know, he's relieved. He's not even upset. He, he knew, because, you know, he was already dying of an illness, and then the whole thing with Chopper and the Amiudaki mushroom and everything. If anything, he's relieved by this. He's just like, oh, okay. Well, then I get to go out my way then rather than, you know, dying at the hands of my students like Mushroom, who he, which he thinks would actually cure him, right? And so in a sense, it kind of did cure him, you know? It's just like because in a sense, um, you know, he his legacy gets to live on and burn in the hearts of like Dalton and Chopper, of course, and Kareha, and now the Sakura Kingdom is now better than ever. Right, so the death of Hiroluk actually did, in a weird way, kind of cure the country long term. That's just how it went, right? But anyway, um, he gives this great monologue here. I'm actually surprised that Wapple even let him have it. You know, I, I think because Wapple, Wapple was probably expecting Hiroluk to break down and like, he's like, no, you fooled me. No, Wapple, you're just too much of a genius. Oh my God, well, this is it. And then Wapple would be like, ah. Hiroluk though, he has this moment where he completely defies Wapple's expectations. He just holds that, he's like, hold on, like hold your bullets, you know, you don't have what it takes to kill me. And he sits down in the snow freaking pops open his suitcase takes out some sake just pours himself a last drink and he's like let me tell you when does a man die when he contracts an incurable illness no when he eats a poisonous mushroom no a man dies when he is forgotten and dalton of course he's the only one in all of wapple's entourage that's really uh, emotionally affected by this 
It, all, all these things that uh, Here Luck is talking about, it just flies right over Wapple's head. Wapple's just there, like, scratching his butt, just like, Huh? What? Man die Man dies when you pump him full of lead. That's when a man dies. Can we hurry this along here? You know, but then Dalton, he's... The, the, the impact of Hiralux's words are really speaking to him, and he begins to just weep. Not just, like, cry. He's weeping. Tears are streaming down Dalton's face because he's heartsick at what his country has become. Because uh, Wapple, I mean, Dalton has been, like, the master of the guard since, like, before Wapple. Wapple's father was the king, of course, before him, and he was all right. He was an okay kind of king. And, like, if Wapple was the one that was responsible for, you know, his dad dying and him becoming, you know, the new king, I would totally understand. Like, I pulled a steady, basically, right? So, Dalton is crying, and he's looking at Here Look, and he's like, Is that true for a country, too? And Here Look's like, Yeah, if the will to carry it on exists, absolutely. And so his last um, his last words verbally are, you know, I've had a marvelous life. Thank you, Chopper. And in, he's thinking at the same time, he's like, don't worry, Chopper. It'll be okay. You were a great student. Your mushroom won't have time to, to take me out. It's all right. I'm doing this my own way. And he raises up his sake glass and he had an explosive in his briefcase and it detonates. And then boom. And then, oh, it doesn't end there. A big a big other really strong moment here was right as the explosion after, because it's like all windy and, you know, it's a blizzard. After the smoke just gets blown away by the blizzard and, and, and wapples off in the distance, like, laughing. like, oh, that freaking idiot, you know? The freaking smoke just gets blown away. And then you see Chopper standing there just like... And then he hulks out and goes to attack him. And then the whole moment with Dalton and Chopper. And Dalton's crying and Chopper's crying. He's like, you just don't throw your life away for this country, man. It's not worth it. And so, you know, he takes um, Here Look's hat, Chopper does, and walks down the mountain. And then Dalton ends up getting thrown in the, in the brig for that, um, you know, moment of insolence. But um, that, of course, sets things in motion for Chopper, asking Kareha to teach him about medicine and everything. And then that sets the wheels of fate in motion for when the, you know, the Straw Hats arrive on the island. So, yeah, that's a beautiful moment from here. Look, like I said, the whole moment in the anime is pretty much flawless. I can watch that scene, like, any time and still get a little bit weepy over it. Um, so, yeah, way to go, Dr. Here Look. You, you saved your country. And also the place that you were at earlier, the Sakura place, that was also probably Wano because everything connects back to Wano. Actually, no, seriously. Like, the way Sengoku spoke about it, it seems like everything does kind of connect back to Wano in one way or the other, right? All right, so moving on. So this will be uh, number seven, and it's actually this moment in the Hero Look moment. The Hero Look moment was 663 votes. This was the closest one out of all of them. So at 669 votes, giggity, was help me, Luffy. Nami asking Luffy for help at Arlong Park. Um, so once again, a, a, a big culmination in a whole arc with Nami that had been running pretty much throughout the East. Uh, we first meet Nami, and she just seems like this very happy-go-lucky uh, cat burglar kind of type. You know, she usually seems very happy and stuff and chipper, but she also will not be above, like, screwing pirates over and leaving them in the water stranded and stealing all their treasure, and that's, like, her character, right? As the saga continues, the East, we eventually start to learn a little bit more about her, and there's a little bit more of a darker side of her personality, things that she's like masking with that attitude, right? And so it, this all comes to a head at the Arlong arc, you know, where we find out about the fisherman Arlong and what he did to Kokoyashi Village and enslaving the people there and uh, the death of Belmir, who was Nojiko and Nami's adopted mother. Um, and not just the death of her, but also like she died so she could give up the last of her money so that Nami and Nojiko could survive. They can continue to live on. And it doesn't stop there. And then in this whole thing with uh, Arlong, you know, basically taking taking Nami as his own private, you know, you know, well, assistant, but yeah, you know where this is going, right? And forcing her to draw maps of the surrounding area to make their whole operation even smoother, right? Because um, she's like the expert navigator. Even at that young age, she had a, a talent for drawing maps, okay? But, but... This is the messed up thing. He gives her a way out. He's like, tell you what, Nami, if you can gather together a hundred million berries then I'll let this town free. I'll just pack up my stuff and then just leave. Now, of course, Arlong had no intention of doing that. 
absolutely none whatsoever. It was dangling the, 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 the bait right in front of Nami. He's like, oh, I'll give you a way out. I'll give you a way out. Doing that solely so she will work for him unconditionally and that she'll give 115% of her effort. Okay, because, you know, that way she'll listen to him because it's like, oh, yeah, 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 you just do this for me, but also if you just do this, then I'm, and then this nightmare will be over forever. If you really want me gone, then I'll be gone. And so that's why she's he she heads out to sea. That's why she begins her cat burglary ways. And then eventually, even after the years of pretty much all of her teenage years, finally at age 18, she has enough money. She returns and she's like, I got your money, Arlong. I want you out. And then Arlong's just like, oh, yeah, sure, Nami, whatever comes comes back is like oh yeah the money you gave me yeah i can't find it anywhere i don't know what happened to it i don't know well that uh, our our arrangement was you present me with a hundred million and then i'll let you go but i don't see the money anywhere meanwhile all the other fishermen are kind of smirking and like laughing in the background like <laughs> yeah, yeah all that money <laughs> yeah we can't find it anywhere no i mean i don't know <laughs> i guess it must have just been getting you know it must have got sucked into the ethereal plane don't know what to do <laughs> okay and so all this comes to a boiling point between Nami and Luffy, where they're in the town, and Nami starts breaking down crying and picks up the knife and just starts going at the Arlong tattoo on her arm, and she just, like, R, like, cursing his name as she's doing it. And then finally Luffy... You know, and this is somebody that, like, Nami apparently has lied to them ever since they first met. Nami was playing them all for fools. Nami stole their ship to get here. Uh, you know, and all the stuff they did there. Um, you know, and only, only pretended to, you know, take out Usopp, too. So it's like, all this stuff Nami's done. And Luffy doesn't care. Luffy immediately forgives her, grabs the knife, has her drop it, and then just takes off his straw hat and just puts it on Nami's head. And... It's not a verbal moment between the two. I mean, there is, like, dialogue, of course, especially, like, it all comes to when, you know, Nami takes the hat and just, she's crying and she turns her head, just like, Luffy, please help me. But on Luffy's end, there's really not that much dialogue. On Luffy's end, it's all about just, like, okay, Luffy's a dense guy, but he can feel a situation like this. When it's, like, that palpable and that intense, he knows it's, like, all right, yeah, I, I know what has to be going down here. I know what's happening. You, you don't need to... You don't need to tell me everything that happened. I can kind of piece it together at this point. Hey, this Arlong guy's got to go is basically what we're getting at here. All right, it's because of this Arlong guy that you feel this way, that you've done all these things. Um, we'll take care of it. And he says all of that without actually, without just that one action of taking off his hat and setting it on Nami's head. That entire message is conveyed. It's like, don't worry. We're your friends. We care about you, Nami. I want you to be a part of my crew. You are a part of my crew already we'll take care of this. And then he turns around, and then Usopp and Sanji and Zoro are all there behind him, and they begin the epic walk to Arlong Park. I also put that as a scene there, but, you know, that also got a decent amount of votes, but not as many as this. They stand in a line, they walk to Arlong Park, and they destroy it. And they just take it out. They just like, all right, this is what has to be done. And so they save Nami, and the people of Kokoyashi, and they all sail off to the Grand Line together. A beautiful end to the East Blue Saga. And this is this is just like the beginning, right? This is the be this is the end of the prologue of One Piece. All right, the prologue, the East. They're not even in the Grand Line yet, and this is this is the culmination of that little story. Tell you what, if One Piece were to have ended right there, like let's say for whatever reason Oda couldn't continue One Piece at that point. Uh, you know, that still would have been a beautiful way to end it out on. You know, Nami being saved, and then everybody just sailing off into the sunset to the Grand Line, and then the, the chapter ends, and then the series ends for whatever reason, right? Uh, that would have been a perfect way to end it. In terms of, like, the emotion, you know, that was, that was beautiful, right? That was a great... And even to this day, there are still people that consider, yeah... Arlong Park, even though it happened, you know, years ago, uh, and there's been so many epic moments since then, which will be on this list. Um, I, in fact, I think this is the only moment from the East Blue Saga that's on here. Yeah, it is. Yep. So that just that just cements its spot in history, right? Like it's even been over a decade, but it over closer to two decades. But it doesn't matter. It's like this. This is it. This is early One Piece at its finest, most epic moment out of the East Blue. All right, so moving on to number six, we got 752 votes for the untimely passing of one Portgus D. Ace. Did I ever tell you the one about the uh, the, the time that the hole got into the ace? <laughs> I just, I just 
for shit. Sh okay, Ace died. Um, and that really sucks. Um, especially for Luffy. I mean, it sucks for everybody, but mostly for Luffy. And also, I guess, Ace, right? Okay. So... This was a roller coaster. This was a saga in and of its own right, all right? This whole thing where it's like Ace is chasing after Blackbeard. It's like, all right, we meet him at Alabasta, really cool character. Blackbeard and Ace have their battle on Bonaro Island. He gets defeated, captured by Blackbeard. Which, by the way, that scene of itself, amazing, because I love the fact we don't actually get to see him getting defeated. It's just this clash between Ace's strongest moves and Blackbeard's darkness, and then just boom, and then we the last scene is just... Ace's hat just floating in the wind and landing on the ground. I love it when Oda does crap like that. I'm a total sucker for that kind of stuff. You know, are you? I am. So, it gets captured. Execution date is set. Luffy finds out about this while he's on Amazon Lily. He's like, I gotta go rescue my brother. Goes through the whole mess of Impel Down. Just misses his brother and Impel Down. Then has to make the journey to Marine Ford with his de facto crew. Crocodile, Mr. One, Buggy, Mr. Three, Jean Bay are all there, right? And Ivankov, uh, Inazuma, everybody's there to try to help out Luffy, right? And so they all go to Marine Ford, which collates in this huge epic battle that's been, um, you know, been hyped for, you know, years before this. You know, basically ever since Shanks and Whitebeard had that moment it's like there's something big coming here right and there's this battle at marine ford right so i'm sure there were a few people out there that were you know adamant that ace was going to die there's like no ace is not going to make it out of this arc okay but it wasn't it wasn't a guaranteed thing we want to think that luffy is going to save his brother of course luffy's the main character he can do this if anybody can it has to be him and luffy's the kind of guy where he's i don't want to say if i would say optimist he's definitely not a realist Luffy's a kind of guy that has his mind, his, his goals, his ambitions set on one thing, and it's like, I'm going to do that. I'm not really going to think of all the negatives. I'm not going to think of all the problems. I'm not going to think of all the things that could go wrong. It's like, I want to get to the end of the Grand Line, find the One Piece, become King of the Pirates. I'm going to do that, all right? He doesn't sit around like, can I really become King? Like, Luffy doesn't lie awake at night like, can I become King of the Pirates? I don't know if I could do this. I don't know. He doesn't second guess himself a lot of the times. He just goes with it. It does happen throughout the series, you know, a few times, this being one of the moments, but he doesn't usually second guess himself. He sets himself on an idea and he's like, I'm gonna do this because that's who I am, right? And so in this case, he sees that his brother is in danger and he's like, I'm gonna go save him. I'm gonna rescue Ace and the Marines and we're gonna get out of there, sail off into the sunset together. Awesome bros. Okay, we're gonna make this happen. But it doesn't happen. Luffy fails. And Ace dies in his arms. And this... Words cannot properly convey how much of an impact this scene had on myself and a lot of One Piece fans. Every, I think every One Piece fan was impacted by this, you know? Um... Oh my god, I just realized that would have sucked if that was your first One Piece chapter. Like, I think I'm just gonna check out this One Piece series today. Click, there's the chapter where Ace died. I'm like, oh, okay, well this guy died. Apparently a lot of people are upset by that, right? No, but if you've been following One Piece for any sort of number of years before this, this, this had an impact on you, definitely, right? Um... Luffy, when he's holding Ace, the expression on his face where his eyes just go, you know, they roll back and he just... And he just, you know, that was so real because, you know, it would be, I think a lot of, because this happens in other anime where like, look at Dragon Ball Z when Krillin died. What, what happened with Goku? Did Goku go into a coma? No, Goku freaking went Super Saiyan and beat the crap out of Frieza. In Naruto, when, uh, in the, um, the Zabuza arc, when Naruto thought Sasuke died, he, you know, releases part of Kurama and fights against Haku, right? So, it would be really easy in this moment to go with that cliche, and like, and even like I just said with Hereluck, Hereluck's moment was also that. Hereluck died, Chopper saw that, he hulked out and attacked Dalton, or went to go attack Wapple, Dalton stopped him, right? So it'd been a lot easier to do that with this moment, just like, alright, oh, no, Ace, you can't die now! No! No! And then Luffy just rages out and goes to attack a kind I knew maybe Jinbei has to hold him back or whatever. But no, I like that he doesn't do that. I like that, you know, Luffy, it's like his mind cracks and breaks at that moment. And you could see that drawn in his, the expression he makes. Because it's like, this is not anything he saw coming. He's like, he knew there was urgency there. He had to protect his brother. He had to go save him. And there was a timeline. But... Like I said, Luffy's not the kind of guy that dwells in, in, in like, the, the, the negative outcome of things. He doesn't sit there and be like, okay, well, what if Ace dies? I'm going to have to maybe, you know, psychologically prepare myself for that. He's like, no, 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 he's not going to die. He's not going to die. I'm going to save him. That's Luffy, right? Well, he didn't. 
and his mind just simply did not know how to process that, and it leads to this. So, I really like the way that Oda did that there. Um, Ace's last words, you know, what was some of his last words were like, you know, it's like, thank you for loving me, or thanking, thank you for making me feel loved. Uh, we find out, of course, his backstory early on at this point, and then after uh, Marine Ford, we get, you know, the backstory between Sabo and Luffy and Ace all together at Grey Terminal and everything like that. So we find out more about Ace before and after this actually happens, so it's kind of sandwiched between his death. You know, that was a cool way Oda did it, too. Um, but, you know, we, we find out about his father, Roger, and how he didn't like his father very much. We find out about his mother, Porcus de Rouge, that died giving birth to him. And so his whole life, he just felt like there's no place for me, you know, and, and was it a wrong, he, like, even as a young child, he talked to Garp, and he's like, was it, was it a sin that I was born into this world? You know, I, I don't even know if I should have been here, right? And so Ace's last words, as I'm sure his life is, like, flashing before his eyes and everything, he's just like, you know, thank you, Luffy, for being my brother. Thank you, Luffy, for loving me, and thank you for being here for me. And then as Ace is a, as a D, Porcus D Ace, he passes away with a smile on his face, and um, yeah, that, that, that kicks off this finale of Marineford, you know, which leads into Blackbeard, leads into Whitebeard's death. Um, and, and I really think that's everything I can just say about it right now. Like, this is one of those moments where I can't really capture into words too much. I tried. I hope that it... it I hope it didn't diminish it at all. I really hope it didn't. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's that's number six. So uh, speaking of death, moving on to number five with 865 votes, a ship gets burned. Not much to really say about that. All right, moving on to number four. Okay, no, no, okay. Number five is the death of the Mary. So this was something I think Oda teased for a little while. I was not reading One Piece weekly at this point, but I believe it was teased in that um, a straw hat will die in the story at one point. And of course, everybody's like, what? And so you might think it's a cop-out that the Mary was the one that died, but oh, no, 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 no. Oda made us love this ship. Oda made us feel genuine sorrow for a piece of wood. That man is a brilliant writer, okay? Like, if you can manage that, you're set. Like, at that moment, I think that was a moment for a lot of people that's like, all right, the rest of this story is going to be a heart-wrenching tale, but I'm okay to deal with that as long as it's by Oda's pen. You know, like, if he made me feel this genuine sorrow for the death of a ship you know, then we're okay. And the Mary, though, wasn't just a ship. It wasn't just a piece of wood, okay? The Mary had her own soul. And we find this out with the Klebautermon and everything. And this was like that eerie beginnings of in Skypea when Usopp saw the Klebautermon. It's like, don't worry. It's like a, a, a small child's voice. Like, don't worry. I'll carry everybody just a little bit longer. And at the time, we're in Skypea. So I'm sure a lot of people were thinking that was some weird ghost that had that had connections to Upper Yard or the Sky Races or something. And it's just like, okay, it's a weird thing Odo to include right there. But he did that as a setup for later. Like, hey, the Mary is taking a lot of damage. And this is something you could see throughout the earlier parts of the Grand Line journey. Like, you know, this isn't like a magic thing in a cartoon where at the end of every episode, everybody just comes back perfectly fine. If anything was destroyed in the previous episode, um, then it's all back to normal in the next one. No, it's like Luffy ripped the mast off the Mary at, at the Twin Capes. And, and, the, uh, and the figurehead got ripped off too. And, you know, Usopp repaired that as best he could. And, you know, it got launched into the air. And, it, oh, it got impaled by Hina's squad, right? That that damage doesn't just go away, right? It doesn't just disappear. Like, all right, at the end of the Alabasta arc, here's the Mary, it's perfectly fine again, right? Um, no, you see the wear and tear on the Mary as the story goes along. And the animation department really did a great job of this by the time we get to Water 7 and Annie's Lobby. And uh, we actually get to see visibly more of the wear and tear the Mary has. And it's just like, hey, listen, guys, it's a ship. This is in the time of, like, sailing vessels and everything. Uh, and you're in this really dangerous ocean. And really, it's honestly a miracle that you managed to get this far without a proper shipwright on board. But 
you know, Usopp just knows basic repairs. He's more of a handyman than anything else. He doesn't know anything about actual proper shipbuilding and how you actually do it. He's not an engineer. He's not a mechanic proper. So it's like... Mary's not gonna get there. And, you know, you think, like, even after they get all the money from Skypea, you think, like, oh, okay, they're just gonna, you know, money's gonna, you know, save the Mary. Everything's gonna be fine. But no, they even get to the people there at, um, Galila, and they're like, it doesn't matter how much money you have. This is beyond our skills. It's over. It's done. She can't, she can't sail to the next island. And if you do, she's not gonna make it, and everybody on board will be sinking beneath the briny deep, okay? And this is another moment from Luffy... Where, and this, this, of course, leads into Usopp versus Luffy, which unfortunately was not on the list. But the Merry Death was closely tied into that, of course. Um, and so Luffy realizes, hey, listen, this, this has to be done. And, but the Merry didn't go out. Uh, the Merry had a very tearful goodbye. The moment when Frankie takes the ship and then Usopp's there trying to repair it even after Frankie knocks him down. Like, you can't fix the ship. It's not gonna, there's nothing you can do. And then it's sitting on Scrap Island and then it like speaks to Iceberg. And it's like, please, just, just fix me up enough so I can be, I, I, I can be of use to my friends. I just need to be there for them one more time. Just one more time. And Iceberg, against his better judgment, he's like, what am I doing out here in the middle of Aqua Laguna fixing up a ship that has no hope for a future anyway? But he does it. He's like, Mary's will like extends to everybody else. It was such a loved ship. Everybody in the Straw Hats was so filled with love and happiness and laughter. Mary just wanted to be there with them for the very end. And so she is. Any's lobby happens, and we kind of like separate from the Mary for a while. We're focused on the battle between the CP9 and, and rescuing Robin and everything. And, and so at the very end of the arc, though, Luchi's defeated. Luffy's there on the ground. He can barely move. Usopp's shouting for him to get up. We can go. We can go back home. We rescued Robin. How are they going to get out of Any's lobby? Boom, there's the Mary saving everybody. And once again, that was another moment that was on the list as well, which ties into this. And so I love that line at the end of that episode where the Mary just arrives there. And he's like, let's go back, everyone. Back to the seas of adventure. Like a child's voice, but it fits the Mary, right? And so they all get on the Mary, and it all sails out of Eni's lobby. They all manage to get away because there's all these giant warships everywhere, but this tiny little caravel manages to just avoid all of them. This plucky little boat manages to get out of there and sail off into the ocean. And so, unfortunately, it doesn't last long because they do manage to get away from Eni's lobby. Mary fulfilled her promise, but they have to part ways with her at that point, and they decide to give her a Viking funeral because, uh, as Luffy puts it, the bottom of the sea is a cold and lonely place, so we're going to light you on fire on the surface. That should give you a warm send-off, but okay, no. It's a very tragic moment. Um, Dear Friends by Triplane cues up in the background, which was actually an ending of One Piece. One Piece doesn't have ending themes anymore, if you notice that, but that was an ending of One Piece, and so they used that song to say a farewell to the Mary... Uh, snow begins to fall for really no reason other than just for dramatic effect. So it begins to fall and everybody's crying. Not everybody. Zoro's not crying. I don't think Sanji was crying either, but not all the Straw Hats have to be a blubbering mess for this to work. You know what I mean? It's just like, okay, Oda still pays attention to their individual character. You know, it wouldn't make much sense for Zoro because Zoro's not a breakdown and crying kind of dude, right? But you can still see it on his face like he's thanking the Mary and just like, you know, thank you for carrying us. You were a Okay, I'm, I'm gonna get serious here for a second with you guys. There's a moment that this reminded me of, okay, in my actual life. All right, all right. This, this is a really personal moment. I don't even know if I should be sharing it. It's not, like, super... Okay. My grandfather passed away in 2013, all right? He was a great guy. Loved my grandfather, all right? Really cool dude. Um, we're at the funeral home. Uh, everybody at the viewing, everybody's together. My dad's there, his brothers are there. And, uh, you know, viewings, we're, we're talking to everybody, friends of the family and everything, and we're just like, oh my god, yeah, he was such a great guy, you know, I love my grandfather, he was such a great man. Um, but there, there was one moment during the funeral where it was just me and my dad. And me and my dad are just standing there, and everyone's around us is talking, and I, I look up at my dad, and my dad is not a crying guy, he doesn't cry, and he, well, he didn't cry at that point. But my dad just had a moment where he was just staring at his dad in the casket, and he just says, he just kind of looks and he's just like, that was a good man right there. And so I'm, I'm standing there next to my dad and I'm like, I just didn't really know what to say. So I just kind of patted him on the shoulder and he's like, well, he, he raised a good son. So that, 
that moment between me and my dad kind of like i see the moment between like you know like zoro and like all the other members of the crew that aren't like blubbering you know they're just kind of staring at the mary and just like silently thanking her for what she did and everything that was a good vessel right there that was a good ship so all right with with that note, uh, moving on to the top four here, we're now getting into the thousands, um, with 1,053 votes. All right, I'm going to back up for this one. I, I got I to gotta clear some. I, I don't want to blow out your eardrums for this one. The One Piece! The One Piece is real! I'm just, no. But no, no, Whitebeard doesn't do that because Whitebeard died on his freaking feet like a man, you know? All right, so this includes both that famous line and also the death of Whitebeard himself because it happens right after this. Um, this is Whitebeard. He's getting gunned down by the Blackbeard crew. He has that final flashback between him and Roger, and just like, you know, he finds out about the Will of D and the kind of man Roger was, and Whitebeard, of course, knows about Roger very well. They were, you know, they were rivals, but they were friends. You know, they were drinking buddies. That's who they were. And Whitebeard had a moment where he's like, you're not the one, Teach. You're not the one uh, Roger's waiting for, right? And I wonder what was going through Whitebeard's head. He's just like, I, I don't know if Whitebeard was... He, he he wanted a family. That was his thing. That was his big thing. And he died having that. He wasn't really into all the grandioseness, I think, that Roger was into. Like, Whitebeard was not interested in becoming King of the Pirates. Whitebeard was not interested in finding the One Piece. Um, and, you know, Roger was kind of into all that stuff. He kind of, like, built it up. He's just like, yes, I'm the King of the Pirates. I'm Goldie Roger. Go and find the One Piece, everybody. Sign now. I don't think Whitebeard would have really seen his death as doing something as grandiose as what he did, but he did it anyway, maybe out of respect for Roger or just to stick it to the Marines. He's just like, you took Ace away from me. I don't really care that much about my life, you know, because Whitebeard, you know, like I said, he had his family with him. He had everything that he wanted, uh, but Ace died. And it's just like, you know what? I I I'm not going to make this easy for you guys. <laughs> You know, I'm going to do something that's going to piss you off even more, you know, and so he just uses the last bit of his strength. He inhales the air in his mighty lungs that have holes punched in them because of a guy new, and he's just like, the one piece is real. That is a statement made by Whitebeard, Edward Newgate himself, so it has all the credulity. He knew Roger personally, and he, because remember, Roger made that decree... 22 years ago, you'd figure in 22 years, there was definitely going to be some debate whether or not Roger was even telling the truth, whether or not the One Piece even existed. I'm sure there were plenty of people that questioned its, its very existence. Like, yeah, Roger died. He was just screwing with everybody. He was just a troll. The One Piece isn't real. It's just some phantom treasure. No one's found it in over 20 years. 20 years. No one's found it yet. It probably doesn't even exist. Roger was just screwing with everybody. But no, Whitebeard comes along at this moment, at this time, and he's like, his last words... One Piece is real. That just reinvigorated the Great Pirate Era right there and sent it down a whole other track. And Whitebeard also says, like, you, before that, he's like, you can't stop it, Sengoku. Someone will find it. Personally, I prefer the dub version of this scene a lot more. I don't know what it is. It just feels like in the, uh, the sub version, the guy, or, you know, the original is the sub, but you know what I mean, like the Japanese version. It just seems like the guy was just reading a line you know, One Piece exists, and they just add an echo effect to it. In in the dub, it just has a lot more grandioseness to it. I guess that's a word. Um, but yeah, so that that's number four on the list. And then of course afterwards he dies, but he dies standing up, and the narrator just goes through every every injury he had. I, I also include that as this part. So yeah, 1,053 votes for Whitebeard as number four. All right, now we're getting into number three, the top three. You guys ready for this? All right. What's it going to be? I think we can all kind of figure which ones they're going to be because they're moments I haven't mentioned yet, all right? Number three, the crew meets Gaimon. All right, uh, I want Gaimon to be back in the story at some point. Gaimon was cool. All right, so number three with 
1,647 votes, also the same year that Christmas was banned in England, because history is some things, and I will teach you history while giving you the top 10 best One Piece moments, because that's how much I care, but 1,647 votes, Luffy punches Charlos out! So this moment is... I would say, you know, equally as epic as a lot of other moments on here, but it's just like something that's like, okay, first off, we don't even find out about the Tenryubito's existence until Sabaody. Sabaody is the first time we even find out that these people exist, and they're these, like, rulers of the world governments, these nobles that cannot be touched by anyone. You know, like, they, they, they're above all laws, they make the laws, basically, alright? So you can't do anything to them. But, throughout that arc, you know, through Hachi and everybody, they explain, like, why you can't. It's like, even if you see them, you know, cap somebody right in the road, you can't go up and even lay a finger on them, because an admiral will show up and lay waste to this entire island. And they have the authority to do that, so you can't even touch them, right? And so... They even kind of beg Luffy and the rest of the crew, like, you can't, you can't. Zoro had a moment, that was also on the list, where Zoro's like, hey, you need directions, buddy? And he almost slashes Charlos, and Bonnie comes up and, you know, like, stops him, right? So it's just like, you can't. You can't touch them. You can't do anything to them. And so, you know, you want to immediately think, like, oh, Luffy's definitely going to do something. But you don't know for certain, because this is kind of a big deal, right? Like, Luffy's definitely not Admiral level at this point in the story. You know, all the Straw Hats teaming up together could not take down Kizaru at that point in the story. It's just not going to happen, right? So it's like... Luffy, come on, use your noggin here. But he's still Luffy. And you know what? If it was any other moment, Luffy probably wouldn't have gotten involved. But he did the thing that you don't do, and that's you mess with Luffy's friends. And so Charlos at the auction house shoots Hachi. He goes down. Hachi doesn't die. He's bleeding. He holds on to Luffy, and he's just like, please, Straw Hat, don't, don't, don't. I know I'm injured. It was my fault. Please, just as a last, last request from me, you can't. You can't do this. And so... He Hachi's just like, you can't. And then he, I think he passes out at that moment. And then Luffy gets free of him. And he just walks up the steps. And Charlos takes some pot shots at him. But he, he can't hit for crap, right? And Luffy's just dodging it nonchalantly. And there's that moment where it's just like, it's so cool. And there's theme playing in the background. And he's walking up the freaking thing. And he's just the seriousness expression on Luffy's face that just, you don't, you see it every now and then in the story, but it's not always a thing. Luffy's a pretty, pretty chipper dude, but at this point, he's just like... Dodging the bullets. Gets right in front of Charlos. Charlos doesn't know what's coming, because Charlos thinks, you know, he was raised his whole life as a tender Yubito. Not a single person has probably ever laid a finger on Charlos before that. Like, and I think they even said that. They, even his father, um, Roswald, has not even laid a finger on Charlos, okay? And and so he's like, Charlos doesn't expect what's going to happen. He's like, oh, if you, you touch me, you're going to happen, you know, Admiral. And then Luffy just, boom, and just punches him. Luffy don't care. Luffy doesn't give. He's like, he's beyond the point of caring at that point. He's just like, you know what? Even if this brings down the judgment of the gods themselves, I'm still punching you in the face. Because you deserve it, you piece of crap. You know, and he does it. Everyone in the auction house looks just like... Like, that's what Luffy literally did. Just summon down the wrath of a god, of a vengeful deity. It's like, like Zeus is about to summon lightning bolts everywhere. So they're like... Oh, no! That doesn't happen very often in the One Piece story. Even other strong pirates like Kid. Kid is kind of this crazy, like, heavy metal pirate. Even he's surprised. It's like, you, there are some things you just don't do, right? Like, even some of the most rambunctious pirates in the world that don't care about anything would still not lay a finger on the tenor Yubito. That's like the untouchable. That's something you just don't do. Luffy did it. He's he's not even like he's not even like a crazy, you know, pirate at this point. He's like legally insane from the perspective of all these other people. Like he's he he is going to be like the, the raft that's going to be brought down on him trumps anything else that like any other pirate could do. Right? It's like, that's, he's declaring himself as an enemy of not just the world government, but the Tenry Bito at that point. And yet his bounty only goes up 100 million after that. You know, after the events of this, after punching out Charlos, after doing everything he did at, at freaking Marineford, only goes up from 300 to 400 million. Huh. But still, where he's at right now, pretty high number, okay? So yeah, Luffy punches Charlos out. That was, that was nothing else, that, it was just a cathartic moment for everybody. 
Because it's like the entire arc, you're seeing them going around doing whatever they want, and uh, he's like, hey, uh, I want that girl to be my wife. Get rid of wives one through five. I don't want them anymore, though. Here, come over here. And just like, it just, you're looking at them doing all this crap, and, um, you know, the, the girl's uh, fiance, who, you know, he's like, hey, that's my fiance. What are you doing? And he gets taken out. It's just like, you just want to see the comeuffins, and just nobody's willing to even go near them, right? Even none of the other supernovas are even willing to go near them, but then Luffy does it, and it just feels so good. And Charlos, of course, he got uh, he got struck out by Mule's Guard recent <laughs> fruit fly. Mule's Guard attacked him recently at Reverie, and we saw that, um, which was also a cathartic moment. But this the moment with Luffy at Sabote that'll always be the absolute best. That'll be the peak. Okay. So, uh, moving on to number two with 1842 votes. What was going on in 1842? Uh, John Tyler was president, first president to become president because of the death of another president. So that's that's cool. 1,842 votes. Robins. Uh, I'm going to back up for this one, too. Hold on. i got to put on my, my Robin voice here. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I want to live! Oh, God, that was horrible. I'm sorry, Robin. I'm sorry. That was bad. That was really, really bad. <laughs> I shouldn't even have attempted that. Okay. So, Robin kind of get the same deal with Nami. Uh, very tragic backstory, and the more tragic parts of her past have kind of just been hinted at at this point. Uh, we get to find out who Robin is really during Annie's Lobby when we see her flashback with, you know, Saul and everything. But long before that, she started off as an enemy, you know, as Baroque works. And even after becoming a member of the crew, though, she was kind of this aloof kind of character where she, you kind of get the impression that's like, she views her stay with the Straw Hats as only temporary. You, you get that kind of impression from her, right? She's just like, well, Baroque Works is dismantled, and I got nowhere else to go, so I guess I'll pal around with you guys for a little while. But she doesn't seem very serious about, like, hanging out with the crew for long terms. And it's just like, okay, this is where I'm at right now. I'll stay with them for as long as I gotta stay with them, and if I feel like leaving, or if another opportunity comes along, I'm out of here. Right? But, of course, the Straw Hats are different from any other crew, like the Baroque Works and any other crews she was part of, uh, because they genuinely do care about her as uh, a Nakama, as their friend, right? So that rubs off a little bit on Robin, but at Water 7, when she runs into her past, and, you know, she met with Aokiji, of course, at Long Ring Longland, but then after that, the CP9 contact her, and it's just like, you, you knew this was going to happen. Like, they, they have a moment with Robin that were just like, you know, we, you knew you were going to get captured, you knew we were coming after you, you know, we weren't just going to let this go, right? And so Robin just kind of goes with them willingly. She's just like, yeah, I think it's time, I think she had a moment where she's like, I think it's time I stopped running. I'm just, I'm tired of running, I'm tired of... I, I'm just going to resign myself to my fate. And that's the sadness that comes from Robin's, like, tale. It's like, her whole life she was called Devil Child. Like, even before the whole thing with O'Hara, people were, like, making fun of her, you know, like, her, like, children and everything because of her devil fruit ability. So she was called a devil. She was called this horrible person her whole life. And so, I think at some point on, like, a subconscious level, she started to actually believe it. She started to actually think, like, I am, I, I am a devil. I really shouldn't have been born. I shouldn't know the stuff I know. And so she's just like, okay, that's it. It's over. And so she willingly goes to Annie's lobby, and she's there. And even after the Straw Hats break through, and they're there standing on the, the courthouse staring up at her. And so they're looking down. And, and, and Robin, you know, she cares enough about them at this point. She's, she's like, I don't want to see them get injured. I don't want to get to, them to get killed by the CP9 or whatever. So she implores them, just, just leave. I don't want you here. Just get out of here. Quit trying to save me. And then Luffy has this moment back and forth, and it eventually just comes to, like, Luffy asking her the question of, like, Robin, just tell us. Like, just don't lie or anything like that. Just tell us straight out. Say you want to live. Do you want to live? If you say yes, we're here and we'll help you. And that's it. You can trust us. And so Robin, it, it's the moment where she has, like, a breakthrough moment, an epiphany, where... It just, like, all these years of, like, self-deprecation and the deprecation of others onto her, it just kind of cracks and breaks apart, and she actually has a thought of, like, wait a second. I can actually have what I want? I didn't even know that was a possibility. But I guess it, I guess it is. So I guess if I, if I can have what I want, I, I want to live. I want to live. 
And then she cries, and, you know, Robin at that point, not somebody that has a lot of emotion on her face. She makes it a point to actually suppress emotion in a lot of regards. And so that very emotional moment. And the crew all just, because they were ready for a fight to begin with, right? They just wanted to hear it from Robin, you know, that that she's going to come back to them and everything. And she wants this. And so Luffy and everybody, Zoro, they're like, okay, well, let's get ready. Let's check the sword. Sword's ready to go. Chopper's like, okay, rumble balls, we're set. Nami, perfect climb attack. Sanji's like, I got, I got, I got legs. We could do this, you know? And so uh, also the scene that happened right after this with the you know, burn down the flag moment. Also, there was a lot of really cool moments there I could have chose from, you know, the burn down that flag moment, Frankie burning the um, blueprints moment. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool scenes there, but... That was the moment there where it's like, okay, Robin, you're, 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 you've always been part of the crew, but now she knows she's part of the crew, and that's what's important, okay? So, beautiful moment. And, of course, Robin is my waifu. Love Robin. Best girl One Piece. So, uh, I'm glad she made number two. Would have preferred she was number one, but you know what? I can't be mad. I really can't be mad because this is a moment where it's like, you know, number one, number one is... Let's let's go through some honorable mentions first, though, as as we leave it completely ambiguous what this is. All right, so okay, um, number uh, eleven was with 590 votes, Luffy versus Rob Lucci. That was the example I gave in the initial video for this that I thought for certain was going to get in the top ten, but no, it got into the top. It got number eleven by a single vote. Yeah, 591 for the number 10, and then 590 for Luffy versus a single vote. So that's what matters. It comes down to the wires sometimes, guys. Number 12 was Brooke's backstory, 522 votes, with um, the Rumbar crew and everything. Like, quartet, trio, do it, solo. Uh, Sage King burned down that flag with 500 votes, was number 13. 14 with 420... 420, bro, was the walk to Arlong Park. Uh, 325 was Luffy versus Katakuri. Uh, also a really good moment that happened relatively, you know, recently in the story. So I'm glad that got pretty high up there. And then we also had 257, which I only included on here because it was a really high voted moment for a comedic moment in the story. And that was when, I think it's the highest rated solely comedic moment in the entire, you know, top list here. Because a lot of people, you know, you watch or read One Piece for comedy, but for like the best moments, comedy isn't necessarily a part of that. So I think out of all these, yeah, I don't think Ace's death was really all that funny, right? Yeah, not a lot of funny moments here, but this was the highest rated funny moment. With 257 votes, Luffy pushes the zombie back into the ground. So in case you were curious of, like, what the what at least my fans think was the funniest moment in all of One Piece, um, it was the moment, I guess, when Luffy pushed the zombie in, or I, I got the highest on the best moment poll. That was a, solely a comedic moment, okay? So that's that moment. Now, uh, one more thing before we get, one more thing before we get, to the moment involving Zoro, which is, uh, I, I'll be honest with you, it's its the moment where Zoro, uh, you know, he, he was, uh, you know, hanging out with Tashigi at Punk Hazard and, like, putting her over his shoulders and running away with her because they're such a cute couple, right? Yeah, that, that's the moment. Now, okay, before we get to this moment, the epic Zoro moment, the undisclosed epic Zoro moment, I just wanted to take a moment for our dishonorable mention. The, uh, out of the, I think, 64 or 65, um, um, options on the poll which one ranked the lowest and you want to guess what it was uh with 11 votes the lowest rated moment was luffy punches bellamy out the second time at dress rosa i put both of them on there because i thought it would be funny i thought it'd be funny to be like luffy punches out bellamy first time luffy one shots bellamy second time you know uh but no the second time he did that at dress rosa ranked the lowest doesn't mean it's a bad scene i actually really liked that moment because that was also a very emotional moment you know bellamy crying and everything and just wanting to change his life and everything and he's always kind of indebted to doflamingo and then uh luffy ends the fight the same way he did back at you know uh mock town but uh yeah yeah so that that ranked the lowest though 11 votes so it didn't take over that well but here we are at the final moment number one with 3,357 votes, the same year that um, Skynet takes over, I guess, <sighs> nothing happened. Nothing at all. 
da 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 Okay, I'm gonna stop. I was like, like, how long are you gonna just, yeah, whatever. Okay, so, all right. You take it away. I don't. Zoro is a man that is completely willing to give away his ambition, give away his his dream, uh, and his, his life, as we've seen with this scene, for the sake of Luffy's dream. Luffy is a man that Zoro respects above all else. Okay, I mean, Zoro respects Mihawk as the greatest swordsman and everything like that, but I think he respects Luffy more. Just because of his, not just because he saved him, of course, at Shelltown or that, that's not even part of it. It's just like, Zoro could see it in Luffy. It's just like, you know what? This is a man I can follow. I'm going to be his, his, I'm going to be his first mate. I'm going to be on his crew. And it's my job to see this man's dream through. Um, and Oda portrays this not with a lot of dialogue or like Zoro thinking about how great Luffy is and I'm going to follow him. No, he always portrays this through Zoro's actions. They tell volumes more than any words could. Um, and so this moment is the height of that. Where after the Urasusa shock on Thriller Bark, everybody's kind of knocked around. Most people are knocked unconscious. And uh, Zoro stands up to defend Luffy against Kuma. And Kuma, being the man that he is, um, you know, he, he kind of looks at the situation and he's like, okay, I am a reasonable bear cyborg man. Um, after the display that you made, you know, Zoro comes out and he's like, you know, take, I know the Marines aren't going to want it as much as Luffy's, but take my head instead, instead of Luffy's. I will give, I will offer that to you. And Kuma's like, okay, I, I, I can't very well go after Straw Hat after you make that claim, but you got to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. You can't just, I'm not just going to leave because you had some impassioned words. I'm not just going to be, I will give my life for his. I'm like, oh, okay, bye. No. You're going to write this check. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you write the check, now you got to cash it, all right? And so using his powers, the pawpaw paw fruit, he takes Luffy, rejects all of the pain and suffering and injury and exhaustion and strife that he has incurred in the battle between Moria and Ors and going into Nightmare Luffy, all the battles he's incurred, the blast from the Ursusha shock, this huge freaking bubble of pure unrelenting pain and suffering and misery. And Kuma's like, you want, it, you want to be so willing to take his spot? Here's the door. Step in, into his shoes. And if you do this, I will leave. I will not lay a hand on anyone other than your crew. Sanji steps in very briefly, of course. Uh, he offers him his head as well. But Zoro is like, nope, it's my responsibility. And once again, I've mentioned this before, but I don't think that was like, like I, I want to sacrifice myself for Luffy. No, I want to sacrifice myself. It's not nothing, it's nothing stupid like that. It's Zoro being the commanding officer here. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm the first mate. This is my responsibility, not yours, okay? I'm not letting you put your life up, plus you're the cook. They need you. I'm the first mate. I'm your superior officer here. I'm the one doing this. And he knocks Sanji out. And he's like, okay, we'll do this. Just, can we, because Zoro's the guy, he doesn't want other people to know about it. He's like, can we just go to another location on the island? Somewhere where there's nobody around, no prying eyes. I'm sure Kuma was like, I understand, absolutely. They walk over. I wonder how that went. I was like, oh my god, can you imagine that? Like, I don't want to break up the, the drama here, but, like, Kuma and Zoro, just imagine them slowly walking away from the battlefield, walking through the forest of Thriller Bark, just... Kuma's holding the giant misery bubble over his head, and just... I'm not, I'm not saying that as a joke, like they were talking to each other. It was a very somber walk, I'm sure, right? So anyway, though, they, that's not important. They get to a clearing, sets down the bubble, and Zoro's like... 
Because you understand, Kuma and Zoro, I think, both thought this was going to be it. Kuma said it. He's like, you've already taken enough damage yourself. You do this, you're going to die. Zoro probably, he didn't say it, but he was probably also thinking it as well. Like, this, yeah, this is going to be it. But he's like, you know what? If it's so that Luffy can continue on, I'm going to do this. But I'm not going to try to die. I'm going to hold on as long as I can. But if it happens, it happens. But this is what I want to do. This is how I'm going out. Goes into the bubble. Fade to white. Next day, everybody's waking up after the blast. Like, what the f happened? Sanji, of course, he remembers what Zoro was going to do. He's rushing to find him. He sees him in this clearing. Blood everywhere. Copious blood. More blood than you think would be in a human body. More blood that is in a human body, but not Zoro, because Zoro's not human. Zoro's a beast! All right? Um, he sees him, and Zoro, to the very bitter end, the level of pain he must be dealing right with right now, he's like, still not going to do it. He's not going to sit there and be like, I took it. I took all Luffy's pain. Like, nope. He's like, Sanji's like, what What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. The animation in that episode was beautiful. Um, they made his eyes, like, all bloodshot. And just, like, he's he's standing up. It's like Whitebeard at this point. Like, he's not even, like, if, if you just tap him on the shoulder, Zoro would fall down. You know, he's just, like, frozen in that spot, like, crossing his arms, like... I did it. This is me, you know. But he didn't say that, of course. But he's just like, you know, this is, this is what I have to do to be the first mate of the King of the Pirates. And uh, of course, Zoro recovers from this. But even even during the fight with Kizaru at Sabaody, it was stated like he still has the injuries from this. This is not something that he just recovered with overnight. But all right, that's that's that. All right, like that's that's the moment. I think I went into enough detail there. I'm not going to try to, like, bog it down by, you know, going on and on about it. Uh, we all know the moment. I mean, that's, it's number one on the list. It's number one in a lot of our hearts as the number one moment in all of One Piece. Um, you know, w when the end of One Piece eventually comes, I'm thinking that Shonen Jump might very well do a poll very similar to this, you know, at, at, to mark the end of One Piece. Like, what was your favorite moment? And you know what? This moment has a very high probability of being on there. And, uh, like, of course, this poll is just from my fans. Uh, this might be more of an international level event, you know, what's going on with Shonen Jump, or, like, a nationwide event for Japan. Maybe Shonen Jump will do, like, another version in the States and stuff, kind of how they do the popularity polls um, with the characters. But, um, yeah, yeah, if you were going to choose and select, like, an objective, like, moment, like, Oda were to come out and, like, officiate a big event where it's like, I'm going to decree the single best moment in my entire manga out of 20-something years, maybe even closer to 30 years by the time it actually concludes, and Oda comes out and he says it's this moment that's the best moment. And, you know, I would love a whole moment. Uh, honestly, like, Oda, you know, he does interviews, but he doesn't show his face very often. He doesn't do interviews all the time, but he does sit down with interviews every now and then. I would love to have an interview where he just maybe sits down and talks about this moment and just like what was going through his head and like you know was it difficult drawing this scene was he emotional when he was drawing this scene you know was he thinking about like you know okay Zoro's character and I got to make sure this scene is perfect because Oda did Oda know the significance of what this scene was going to mean for here we are over a decade later uh, since Thriller Bark that this went down um, and we're still here it is so I would really love to hear just like an interview maybe like five minute ten minute interview of Oda just talking about this one moment that would mean the world to it um, or even a written interview right something just from the man himself but anyway uh, that's that uh, this is this has been the top 10 best moments in One Piece. This is already a long video, so uh, I'm going to try to I'm gonna edit and get this out as quickly as possible. Uh, I appreciate everybody and the continued support. Um, the next popularity poll, I don't know what it'll be. I, I do one a year, but I don't know. This one was pretty much, this one was like the most streamlined one we did, honestly. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see where this goes from here, you know. But anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. I always appreciate it. Techie 101 signing out. Um, leave your comments below on your favorite moments and what they meant to you personally. Later. You did it, Barry. We made it through. Love you, Barry.